And our next talk is by Sean. Take it away, Sean. Hi. Called Rupeu Timonga, called Tikapa Moana Timoana, no Aotearoa Ahu. I found my Ahu e Kidikiri Roa. I tupu ake iaho e tamara nui. Ke tamaki makoro noho ana aho inaine. Ko natai pakiha te iwi ko shan harris. Rupehu is my mountain. The Hariki Gulf is my sea. I am from New Zealand. I was born in Hamilton. I grew up in tamara nui. I live in Auckland now. My people are Nati Pakiha. I am Sean. So, I'm Sean Harris. You may know me as Fobsky. Um, I'm an information security consultant that's predominantly worked in the enterprise space for the past 10 or so years. And this is my story. What is this talk about? It's how I felt like an imposter since I entered security in 2010. That's how I tried to be anything but empathetic in my various security roles during that time. How I accepted how I worked and finally gained the confidence to work how I work. And how all my previous experience came together in the most trying time of my career. So, let's start at the start. My first job back in 2002 was working as a help desk on a point of sale software desk. Um, this company I worked for developed stock management programs for liquor stores. So I'm supporting people who essentially their head office had decided on a piece of software and told them this is going in all your stores. They're not technically literate. You've got tons of issues technically. Um, they don't understand what's going on and they do not want to talk to you. And so for the first couple of months on that help desk, it was pretty hard because of the fact that here I am. Um, I know a bit about tech. I'm trying to help them. But they're very resistant and just you know, uh, swear at me. There's no relationship there. It wasn't until one day when I started talking to someone where he, he simply said, oh, so, so, so you're from Auckland, eh? Because that's where the head office was. Uh, and I'm like, yes, I live and work in Auckland, but I'm originally from Tamaranui. From there, in a flash, it went from complete you know, resistance to, oh, hang on, I've got relatives there. Oh, yeah, who are they? And believe it or not, it turns out that he used to take my aunt when, uh, when he was at school, because he grew up in that area. But word got out that, hang on, there's a, someone in Auckland that you can talk to. He's not from Auckland. He's from this particular area they can relate to. <laughs> so that made my job a hell of a lot easier because people would call up and they wouldn't know my name. They'd just like, oh, give me that kid from Tamaranui. Um, <laughs> so I'm on the phone, and that's working really, really well. And I had a great 18 to 24 months working there. Made lots of relationships. Um, and that's sort of how I developed my working style is that I get introduced to someone. There's that period of awkwardness. But I try and find a place where we can meet in the middle, begin conversation, and get things done. And it's from there when I moved to a managed service environment where I went to work for a New Zealand, small New Zealand ISP. Started off on help desk, went to corporate support desk, finally through the network ops. Um, but at the same time, because it's a small team, I was involved in pre-sales, RFPs, customer meetings. So I was part of the business as a whole. I wasn't just help desk. I was someone that could be utilized all across the business, and I wanted to know what was going on. Because if I knew what was going on, I could help shape things. So, um, and I'd also provide live demonstrations about what the tooling and what it is we actually do. So as an example, um, there was a new firewall that came out, and the sales team had no idea what was going on. They were just you know, putting margins on and trying to flick it out. So one day, I'm like, OK, I'm going to show them what this, what this actually does. So I put it in line with the corporate network, Block trademe.co.nz with, uh, with a message that said, hi, your indiscretion has been noted and will be discussed at the next board meeting. Um, <laughs> and suddenly I get all the sales staff, everyone that's trying to visit that particular site on their lunch break saying, sorry, please don't report me. Um, but what that did was that when they went out to customers, they had a story about, well, here's this product that does a firewall, but do you know this guy pranked me, he's a funny guy, um, that it does this. And it was relatable by, by the client, and things worked. It just worked out. Um, so customers were happy. Salespeople were happy. 
but I wasn't. I was, at, I was at the point where I thought, cool, I'm technical, I'm gonna go somewhere else and I want to move cities. So that's when I got my first security role. When people ask me what got me into security, it's a case of I wanted to move from Auckland to Wellington. <laughs> I was network ops, I was on firewalls, I was doing all this typical managed service stuff. Um, but through those interactions, you know, I'm able to talk to people. I'm, I'm able to relate to different people at different levels. So come into this security analyst role um, where they knew my mistakes because as part of any learning process, you make mistakes. And I've made some massive ones in the past about taking down networks, um, breaking government DNS, like all, all types of things. So I went into this role thinking, cool, I'm gonna learn stuff and people are gonna wanna be helped because it's security. But of course, you go into that role, it's a new team, they've only been established I think nine months beforehand. You've got 10 years of established working environments, ways of working, processes and everything being done. So when you go in there, no one wants to talk to you. And that's when I kind of first had my, my first conscience uh, issue because there was a lot of work being done to be authoritarian that is, hi, hi Mr. Outsourcer, we need you to do this now. And they're like, well, that's all well and good, but I've got 15 other things to do. Have you got money for it? No, cool, not gonna touch it. And that was the same when I went around all the different groups in, in my role. Um, you know, I'm trying to, trying to get conversations going, trying to do what the various frameworks, engagement models, project methodologies, all that business stuff. I'm trying to stay within those lines because that's how things should work, isn't it? But it wasn't. Which made me come to the imposter syndrome enters my life and does not leave. Because I'm trying to work in a way which doesn't suit me and the frameworks which don't suit me I, I want to learn, and at the same time, I'm attending all the meetups, conferences, vendor, vendor things, just anything. I just want to learn and figure out the way for how, how for me to work through and deal with this. Um, but that wasn't working, because a lot of InfoSec is all about the technology, the, the attack, and there are some really amazing people in that space, and I've got massive amounts of respect for them, but that's not me. The same thing for, you know, I went to fraud, I went to audit, I went to compliance, I just went to any meetup to try and find some area which I fit. And it, it, it didn't. Um, and it wasn't until I came to a conference and I bumped into someone that would, um, that I consider a mentor now, where he was the first person to have a conversation with about the fact that, you know, I've got all of this stuff going on and people don't want to do it, blah, blah, blah. And he was the first one that said, hey, you should consider being pragmatic. Um, so this is my first step away from being fully security orientated to something a bit different. Because pragmatism to me is doing not, not to be a minimum, but what is suitable for that environment. If you have a small environment, you don't need to chuck the whole NIST framework and everything like that. You spec it, provide control and advice to that particular environment. And that, that spoke to me. So from then on, when I was approaching problems, I would, I would use that. But at the same time, I developed my own work style. And this work style is probably what gave me the, the greatest sense of being isolated. And that was because it's different to anything else which, which at the time was being talked about. So essentially, what had happened is I'd already come to the conclusion that the business is going to business. Security can't stop the business making dumb decisions. You've just got to inform it. If they go on and do something silly, it's on them, it's on the CEOs, it's on the execs. So I was comfortable with that. And what was happening was I was ending up at the teams that would absolutely avoid security, which is normally marketing because they're doing things quick, getting it out, personal data, they just need to get out there to beat market, and it's a fast moving environment. So the first thing I'd do when I'm meeting a new team is to go there and let them speak their passion. These people like us are passionate about what they do, and if we're there interrupting them every 20 seconds about can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, they're gonna stop it, close you out, and not allow you to be part of their team. So I let them speak their passion, and then at the end of it, I will say, okay, I hear what you're trying to do. Here are my concerns, maybe we can help address them. Or in some cases, I will say no, but it's tied to not theoretical things, it is um, Any time I say no, I tie it to specific compliance, audit, 
or real-world examples, because that makes it real. If you're talking to someone and say, well, there's a risk someone might, might get in here, okay, has that been done before? Uh, I think so. Look, I, I can do it. It's like, okay, you, you can do it. Has this, has this happened in the wild? That's a bit different, whereas if you can go to someone and say, hi, you're launching this product. Three months ago, this product went on the market from a competitor in another territory. Look what happened. We need to make sure this, this doesn't happen. That speaks to them. It's a story they can tell their boss, which the boss can speak to management to say, hey, we've got to delay, we've got to rewrite, or do you want to take the risk? So you, you can get some momentum there. Um, promptly respond to any further questions. The amount of times when things get missed purely because you've seen an email, you don't respond to it, they're like, well, hang on, I've got, got to do this in three days. They haven't come back. I'll assume he's okay with it. Off you go. So that's, that's something key. If you're dealing with anyone in the business, respond as promptly as possible. Even if it's just, hi, I'm busy, it's going to take me a couple of days to get back to you. That communication and keeping those paths open is key. Um, do desk walk-bys with, with the team. If you're hidden behind a ticketing system or a chat bot or anything, that's, that's the way you've been told to engage with the business, that's not going to work. You're just an electronic form. If you can get out there and outside of um, you know, steering meetings, be there at the desk, walk by with a coffee, have a chat, find out what's going on, that opens up a lot more of conversation. You find out what's going on. They may say, hey, we're thinking about doing this. You get involved in their strategy, and you become part of their team, which is what you want to do. Because I don't want to be the security guy. I want to be a trusted advisor and friend in order to get to the bottom of things, keep them going, and make sure we're, we're secure. Another thing which, which I did was I fight for them in, in the business. So there's a whole side of IT which is hidden from these, company, or sorry, from these areas of the business. You've got architecture. You've got change management. You've got all these different review boards, which they're not part of. They just say, hi, I want to deploy this product. And it disappears into a black hole. And I might come back with a no with no explanation, because no one in the IT side of the thing know, knows what's going on. Or it'll just get deployed. And where I've worked predominantly, it's been a no. And so they get frustrated. And then it's just, hey, deploy it. Don't care about anything. Company's insecure. Whereas if I knew something controversial is coming through, I will go find the architect, the change manager, whoever is going to be the main objector, and just say, I'm across this. I'm comfortable with it. What are your concerns? Because there's also a preconceived notion from some parts of the business that, well, it's marketing. They don't know what, what they're doing. I'm going to stop this until I find out more info. So if you get in their face and go, hi, they're doing this. Security's comfortable with this. What's your problem? Onus is on them. It's, it's no longer a, uh, a business decision which they can swing. It is, you've made this decision. OK, you should have a talk to them now, because we're going to go uh, for approval tomorrow or something like that. Um, so by doing this relationships form rather than forced engagement, because I'm not a fan of that, if you, if you get a meeting booked and it's because, hey, person over here wants you to, wants you to do the speak, they're not going to be, they're not doing any introductions, that's really awkward. And I'd rather be able to approach people and have these conversations um, just to keep things moving. So I was achieving these results, but feeling like I do not belong. So I, I had some amazing wins um, in, inside the business. I was working in security. I was feeling good professionally. But when I attend conferences or get outside of my little work bubble, there's just a huge amount of nagging doubt that followed me um, up until fairly recently. And that's because you, you go to conferences. You go to all these things. And it's all attack oriented up until PurpleCon. I'll give them that. Um, but, and it's really awkward, because I'm impressed by that, but it's not what I do. And, I'd, and I could never, ever find that, that group to, to go to. Um, and then there was one day which, which just really gave me a massive crisis of confidence. And that is, I'd spoken at a conference, and all the speakers were up the front of the room. And the question was asked from the audience, uh, so, so speakers, what, what makes a security professional? Quick as a flash, someone jumps in and says, right, so you do your three-year degree, and then you do your CISSP, and then you are a security professional. <laughs> which, is, which is fine. Like, but, but for me, being that the only thing I have against my name is an A-plus certificate I got in 2001, 
when I dropped out of uni. Whereas, and the only other things I have is my experience, my personality, and the way I interact with people. That was really damning because at the same time, I'm looking for ways to try and upskill myself in this particular area, but there's none. It's all about technology or frameworks or engagement methodologies when, in fact, none of that helps me in my day-to-day -day life when I work. I'd rather get up there with people, tie everything to a standard, um, a regulation, or anything that is related to their business and base all my decisions off that rather than an arbitrary framework which suits security but no one else for the rest of the business. So I'm, I'm working through this because um, with working with all the people, because of my background in managed services, I can put myself in their shoes. I'm someone that can speak, speak to someone in pre-sales and say, I've been forced to do this, I've got to get it out in two days, here's my design, I'm not happy with. And it's not fair that me as a security professional is sort of like the, the guillotine for the initiative because this person doesn't have the time or the budget to go ahead. So I, I fight for them. I fight for them inside to say, look, this can go ahead, but we need to ensure this is done, put more pressure on management to say, look, let them do their thing. So that's a different working style compared to anything else that I'm aware of. And then in 2016, I started a new role. And I was with the company for a year. And in 2017, we went to the, uh, to the Global Security, uh, Security Officer Conference. And it was there where I met people from uh, Australia, Canada, the States, Latin America, UK, Russia, and India. And by being exposed to these people, it was quite interesting just to see the different threats, the different things they have got to deal with, the different business problems that everywhere around the world has, has to deal with. And it was during one of these sessions with the team where we did a management exercise, which of course, um, they have called management exercise, That's, that sounds like a fun way to spend an afternoon. Um, but what it was, was that it was, a, it was a personality type exercise, right? And rather than the whole Myers-Briggs is what type of bird or whatever it is um, that you are, this was one just based around personality traits. There was authoritative, transparent, curious, and empathetic, and you, were, and you were given a score. So out of the 30 odd people in the room, there was about 20 that were in the authoritative space, 10 that was in the um, curious space, two in the transparent group, and a group of four of us in the empathetic zone. So that's the first time I kind of heard empathy as a personality trait. I was just like, well, I'm just working how I am. But when I spoke to the four people around me, um, it turns out that they work the same. They don't work on you must go do this, you must do this. They form relationships, they want to know what's going on so they can form the bigger picture and help the team rather than just being a, being a touch point. And, and for me, it also came up that on, on the chart, which, uh, which measures your personality, it was, I think, zero to 21, because there were 21 questions and you're kind of measured and you get your star map to show you're strong here, here, and here. For me, um, I scored 18 in empathy. So I was like, I'm way down here. I'm completely different to everyone else in the room, but I've got a little group of people down here that I can share these experiences with. And, and that was affirming. That's the first time when I'm like, right, other people have this same, same trait, and maybe they're dealing it with the same way. And it turns out it was. And that was empowering. I felt for the first time, cool, this is a valid way to work in InfoSec. I'm ready to go. And that was really good because I came back um, the company I worked for at the time was Equifax New Zealand. So I went from a really big team building environment, feeling really fantastic, to full on breach mode. And one thing I can say is that when you're under pressure, if you've got any type of front, maybe you're trying to be something you're not, that comes out. There is no way I could be any of the other personality types apart from emp empathetic when you're under that amount of pressure, that amount of spotlight, and affecting so many people. Because in the previous year, I had gotten to know all of the sales teams, the product teams, IT teams. I knew all their initiatives. I knew all their strategies. As soon as this was announced, that's all gone. It's now a global remediation effort. So you've got a bunch of disaffected people who are now looking at me, saying, hey, can you please provide me guidance? I'm not the one to guide you. I'm just the resource down here. This is being um, driven from overseas. And that is a very different scenario to anything else I've ever experienced. If 
Uh, I, in the past, there's been jokes about, you know, it would be great to have a breach so we're in the spotlight and we can do things. You do not want that. <laughs> that is by far the worst way to do security transformation you can ever do. Um, it's stressful, it breaks you, but at the same time, this is an experience I wouldn't trade for anything else in the world because it proved to me that my empathy working with people can work. Because, because they'd shared what their plans were, I saw the list of what was going on. I'm able to tie project and, uh, sorry, product or sales or customer improvements to this list. So they don't lose out. I could have gone full on authoritarian high security, let's start from the number one priority down. I didn't. I looked down that list and instead of seeing time or cost or technology, I saw the people responsible for it. I knew what they were doing. I knew that there were other compliance activities that were put on us by the regulators prior to the breach. I went down that list and went, right, what can I do? And what can I do to help the company and these people achieve their goals? And by doing that, that, um, that improved a lot of things. People felt included, despite the fact that we were heavily under the pump from everywhere. People were happy, sure, that they, that they weren't where they wanted to be because all of their plans had been um, destroyed. But at the same time, they were included. They knew I was fighting for them. We could have those conversations that come to me and say, hey, if we do it this way, can we get onto this particular, um, uh, this particular project or can we do it like that? I help them find inventive ways to, to solve solutions and still keep customers happy because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make people happy. So where am I now? Well, I'm, I'm back to the start. I now know who I am. I now know what I want to do. I now know how I work, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, I've got the confidence to, to work how I work, and when I left Equifax, um, I took a break. And then I came back, and when going through this process, I said, this is how I work. I can't do it any other way. I want to be who I am. And I'm once again answering phone calls, building relationships, and getting things done. So first of all, thanks to the wider ends of information security community. Um, you have helped a lot over the past 10 years with me. I've had many good conversations with people about all my random, <laughs> random thoughts and theories. I want to thank Dean Carter who was the one that helped me identify that there is another way. You can go down this path of being people orientated and not security heavy handed. I want to thank Chris Cormack for assistance with the Pepeha. And if you ever need to talk to someone about any of the subjects I've covered, please feel free to come and have a chat to me. My DMs are open on Twitter. Um, I'd rather have someone out there contact me now than go through the six or seven years of self-doubt that I had. Thank you.